Welcome everyone to Urban Confluence Silicon Valley, today's webinar. We're really thrilled to have all of you with us. We're here to answer questions and to guide you in any way necessary to get you to the finish line and complete your submissions. As you probably know, our competition deadline is now July 1st. That's July 1st of this year. We postponed uh, out of respect for all of you in the world who needed more time as a result of the COVID crisis. So I think a lot of people are spending a lot of time in home offices or at home in general. So you should have plenty of time to finish your submission. Just know that even if you haven't begun it yet, you have plenty of time. There's more than nine weeks left. We are looking for grand ideas, not highly detailed plan sets. It's really my pleasure today to have as my co-host, Amy Critchett. Uh, Amy's been working with us as a trusted consultant. She has immense experience in the public art realm. And uh, with that, my pleasure to introduce Amy Critchett. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's safe and taking good care out there. Um, really appreciate being invited to to present to you all today as you're thinking about this incredible opportunity with Urban Confluence Silicon Valley. Um, Steve asked me to join today to share some uh, past perspective of some of the projects that I've been honored to work on and to um, discuss with you all ways of thinking about your path moving forward. I'm an independent consultant and I have a company called AC Eclectic Creative Services Worldwide. Um, I have a, a practice that traverses the media world as well as the public art world and creating experiences in the public realm. Giving credit where credit is due, I'd like to share a little bit about this image that I'm showing you. This is the incredible work of a contemporary art team Eric Adegard and Patricia McShane. They have a robust and exciting career that includes creating graphics for some of the largest brands in the world, as well as deep experiential artworks in the public realm. And more than anything, I think that I'd like to lead this conversation with the, with the filter that I tend to use um, in my work, which I really believe that art matters. And I really know that artists matter. More than ever, it's time for our world to really um, embrace the precept that we need to expect art to happen. And in the context of this conversation, and while you all are here thinking about San Jose, I really know and believe in my heart that there's a magnificent opportunity to together create a really wondrous and intentional and iconic public artwork and place that um, will be celebrated around the world. So taking a little step back in the Wayback Machine, part of my perspective comes from where I come from and my history. Um, I was born and raised in Northern California and um, Actually, I'm honored to live in my hometown, which is Petaluma, California, just about 40 miles north of San Francisco. In 1976, my mother um, told myself and my brothers to get into our VW bus because we were going to go see a quote unquote fence. I had no idea what I was about to experience, but it ended up being a night that had a very deep and long lasting impact on my life. Christo and Jean-Claude had unveiled the running fence in 1976 after four years of hard work to manifest this incredible artwork. This was a piece that was 25 miles long. It was about 200,000 square feet of fabric and it was on view for 14 days. It took 18 public hearings to manifest this artwork, three presentations in, for, in front of the California Supreme Court, and a 450-page environmental impact report. All this I'm sharing with you as we think about what 
one very lucky team will be invited to do in San Jose. This artwork changed the way that myself as a, a young girl saw the world. And I encourage you all to think about this opportunity in San Jose to impact those young and old who will be impressed by what you do. Many, many, many years later, as um, a producer, I was asked to think about the Bay Bridge and invited by someone who had a big, bold idea, Ben Davis in San Francisco, who had invited a really magnificent contemporary artist, Leo Villarreal, to think about this San Francisco Bay Bridge as a canvas for an artwork. We as a team, very similar to what Steve and his team are doing in San Jose, created an opportunity and then made the absolute most of it. The Bay Lights is a combination of many, many moving parts. And certainly as the creative and visionary and um, conceptual side of the work absolutely leads the way for the masterpiece, I encourage you all to think about all of the moving parts that it takes to make something like this happen. First and foremost, there's the vision. And Leo Villarreal, who has his studio in Brooklyn, was paramount in articulating a beautiful, timeless, strong, but quiet artwork. The Bay Bridge as a piece of infrastructure is one of the most important arteries in North America. It is not built to support a sculpture. With his vision, we were able to talk to all of the powers that be and move all of the mountains to turn this incredible structure into one of the most important pieces of public art of our day. This is me in the top left corner after walking up the cables on one of my many um, exciting adventures making the Bay Lights happen. Part of that adventure is the politics and pleasures of, of embracing different stakeholders and um, having the governance to be able to do the work within the, with the substrate that we were working on. So Caltrans, the city and county of San Francisco, the Audubon Society, ultimately the Coast Guard became one of our biggest, um, most important relationships. Each one of these agencies had the capacity to say no and stop the artwork from happening. And it was very important to address each respectfully, answer all of their questions, enter into all the legal agreements, and to really take every aspect of making the Bay Lights very seriously. The other aspect um, was certainly raising the money. Um, this public artwork was completely privately funded and a major part of the work that myself and my team did was to invite patrons to participate with us. Certainly forward facing press um, and social media keeping the community engaged, keeping the community informed of what the potential of this project was, and then ultimately once we went live to celebrate it and to share it. 2013 was when we launched the Bay Lights for the first time and social media was in its you know, earlier stages of development. So we experimented in every platform that we could on how to create awareness and um, share this great story. We had a documentary film made about us which is uh, viewable um, on Venmo, I think. Um, we were experimenting with Instagram early days and certainly you know, playing with all forms of social media to expand the story of the Bay Lights. I collaborated with a series of other artists to create ways to engage the community, to engage patrons, and to you know, further extend the pulse of this beautiful project. So all this to say, you know, doing these sorts of projects takes a lot of true grit um, and um, a lot of tap dancing, let's say. It's a constant balance between making sure that all of your stakeholders are on board 
and that you've got all the different systems in place simultaneously. Now with San Jose, you will be partnering with Steve and his team who will be managing much of that process, but understanding the complexities of it and participating as a good actor is a really, really vital role in developing something of this scale. So since the Bay Lights working with Leo, um, we've had the opportunity to do all sorts of very exciting public artworks. Um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about Illuminated River with you, which is our current artwork that we're working on, because similar to uh, Urban Confluence, this was a competition. So this was a competition that was mounted by the Rothschild Foundation, was um, asking teams to form to consider the Thames and consider what working on 14 bridges on the Thames to create the world's largest public artwork would be. So with Leo's vision, we, our team at our studio in Brooklyn, partnered with architects in London and um, in collaboration with a series of different um, engineering firms, lighting firms, and public engagement firms, we presented what is now Illuminated River, which was the winning submission. What I'm showing you here are some early renderings of um, the 15 bridges. Well, unfortunately now it's 14, but the 15 bridges that um, this artwork will address. This is a simulation of, London, of the London Bridge. This is Cannon Street. This is Suffolk and this is Millennium. I'm showing these, you these four because these are the four that are now actually of the 15 bridges. Again, this is a simulation that are live. So this is, this is London Bridge, which is lit every night, Cannon Street, Suffolk, and Millennium. Currently in this project, we are now addressing the next five bridges and um, over the next several years, ultimately will finish the entirety of this project. I share this example with you as encouragement to think about and to plant the seed. This opportunity is a really special and magical one in San Jose. This confluence of these two bodies of water in the middle of this evolving urban setting is really, really powerful. And there's a real energy and a real magic around this site. And what Steve and his team have created is an opportunity for you all to consider this and to really create something world-class and renowned. So if art is the queen of all sciences and really is a catalyst to realize the truth, then a boldness around the creation of an artwork and a placemaking opportunity, I believe has real magic to it. So I'm gonna leave you with this, be bold. We need this work, we need your creativity more now than ever. You're gonna to demonstrate to the world what it takes to be creative and to be evocative. And with that, I hope that we're able to applaud your work and to herald your creativity in a way where it's an example for us all to follow to ever expect art in the world we live in. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amy. This is Steve again. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled that Amy was here talking about grand vision and spectacular world-class projects that she was involved in that have been built. I just want to remind everyone that every great project begins with a great vision. And so that, that's where we are. We want you to be thinking large, thinking big, thinking important. Uh, I think art and architecture and beauty matter now more than ever, uh, especially when we're all sheltered at home. I think we're all craving artistic experience. A lot of us probably listening to a lot of music at home, another way to get our art fix. But we really do want you to 
to go, go as large as possible. Uh, a reminder, I am constantly available. My cell phone number appears everywhere in our materials. We are easy to get a hold of. We are here to support you and you can call or email us anytime. So Amy and I are now going to answer a bunch of questions. We'll do our best to not speak at once. Uh, a reminder, so the Q&A section is now open. Uh, so please click on it, start sending us questions and uh, Amy and I will answer them as well as we can. First question, uh, social things have changed with COVID-19. Should we consider that? I'm not sure how to answer that question. I think that we all have a heightened awareness of the importance of being outdoors and being in groups together. H how you might inform your idea with COVID, I really don't know. Amy, any thoughts? I think absolutely when you're conceiving of a vision in the public realm, you really need to take the cue from the site itself and the environment that that site is within. So we're all living in a new world impacted by the realities of the pandemic and with the uncertainty of how things are going to evolve in the future. So yes, you should consider it. Next question is, <clears throat> will this presentation be available later on? The answer is yes. All of our webinars <clears throat> appear on our website. Just go to the um, uh, competition section and you'll see webinars and site tours. We may very well have another site tour also in the next few weeks. That's mostly just relevant to people in the Bay Area unless someone wants to get uh, on a plane and fly, which is pretty rare right now. So. Uh, we will continue to post those for you. And when we do site tours, we always post them on our website also so that all of you have, ha have access to the same information. Are you encouraging submissions that focus on one area of the park or potentially in multiple locations, maybe to be completed in stages? You are welcome to use as much as uh, as much of the park as you'd like, as long as it's in the buildable areas. So if you're, if you've already done some research, you know that the west side and the east side uh, are both available. You can have structures or other things span from the, from one side to the other. There are definitely limitations that are clear in the brief and also in the materials that we've provided. So if you haven't already done so, and you're going to submit, you must go spend an hour, read the brief, go on to Submittable, which is the platform for submitting and read the various uh, constraints that exist. Uh, like with any site, we have our constraints. And if I may, Steve, I, I really encourage everyone to think about one of the real gifts of the site. As I mentioned in the presentation, it, it, it wasn't until I walked the site that I really was taken by the scale and the um, really that power of these two, the presence of these two bodies of water in the middle of this crazy urban setting. I mean, really think about that. Really think, I really feel like the winning idea is going to to really embrace and celebrate and heighten the fact that that convert that confluence is is in the midst. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of other questions about site in a moment, but <clears throat> one reminder is that this site was selected uh, as a result of a very deep site selection study done in 2018, and. Part of the reason it was chosen, in addition to these natural attributes that Amy was talking about, the river and the riparian corridor and the trees and nature, is that it's right across the street from this immense uh, Google project that's being planned and also virtually next door to the new Bay Area Rapid Transit BART station that's going to bring people from all over the Bay Area easily into downtown San Jose and also next to Diridon Station and the SAP Center where the San Jose Sharks play and also there are hundreds of concerts every year. I only bring all that up to make the point that this is a new time for this, this site <clears throat> and it's going to just get more and more urban, more and more exciting and more and more used over time. And we, we, we think we're really the catalyst for that to a large extent. 
how many groups do you think are going to participate in the competition? I think by groups, the person means submitting individuals and teams. Uh, we expect to get uh, three to 500 uh, submissions by the end. We really have no way to predict that. We've got about 150 completed submissions so far. Uh, everyone who does competitions has said that we're going to have a huge influx at the very end. Something important I want to mention that I really want you all to take to heart is with a July 1st deadline, we do not want to re receive hundreds of submittals on July 1st. So what we've offered is if you submit by June 22nd, and you can see this on our website, we will do a technical evaluation for you that uh, simply make sure that you're, you don't have any technical mistakes in your submittals. So please try to submit by June 22nd. And in the meantime, as you're producing your submission, feel free to call me or email me with questions that'll give you more comfort that you're, you're following the rules of the competition. And the rules are not onerous or that significant. It's really very straightforward. So uh, another related question is, can I submit before the June deadline? Of course, so please submit as soon as you can. If you submit now, we will do this technical review now. As soon as we, we get your submission, we will do it and you'll either hear from me or my assistant, Denise Franklin. Got a comment, great work, Amy. I agree, thanks, Amy. Uh, good morning, with my team, we have some questions about the site. If we design an aerial structure that needs support, I think this means uh, foundational support at different points, we would like to know what other parts of the land, other than those designated for the project, can be used to support the building or the structure. Uh, the answer is those supports have to stay within the areas uh, on the east and the west available for the competition. So you are not allowed to put large footings inside of the riparian corridor. The map is very clear about where you can and cannot add uh, elements, in particular structural elements. This question about airspace, uh, the height limit for your submissions is 200 feet. Uh, the, the actual height limit of the site is actually slightly more than that, but we we made the decision to just use 200 feet for the competition. So don't suggest things over 200 feet. How much related to technical aspects should we highlight in the proposal? We're looking for a grand vision. If insofar as technical aspects help you express your vision, include as many as you like on both the design presentation board and in your project statement. But again, we're not looking for a plan set. We're looking for a vision. I want you to think about the jury looking at three or 500 or however many submissions we get and they're gonna only have so much time and bandwidth to look at each submission. You need to communicate your grand vision and the inspiration to them quickly. So uh, higher level ideas are far more important than, than micro details. Amy, you wanna to speak to that at all? Sure, sure. I, just to reiterate, I think that the, the, the job right now is to, as Steve mentioned, communicate your big idea and know that you will be, you know, you have a fairly small footprint in which to do it. Um, so focus on, focus on the heart, focus on the, you know, the, the vision, the, the why, you know, why this is important. Um, it can be a sketch, it could be a beautiful render, but the jury's going to be looking more for the context and the vision and the why um, over the production value of the submission. Thank you, Amy, I think that really helps. Uh, another question about, uh, it says, I reviewed the RFP materials and I'm wondering whether proposals with lighting components are discouraged due to environmental reasons. What is the expectation for the new landmark with reference to the original light tower? I'm really glad this question was asked. We are not asking you in any way to do something related to the original San Jose light tower. If you, and if you don't know about it, it's not critical, but you'll read about it in the brief. But lighting is very important to what we want to do. 
Uh, we were inspired by the original San Jose Light Tower that existed from 1881 until 1915, but it, it in no way is prescriptive related to the design that all of you are coming up with. But lighting really matters. We want this landmark to be spectacular during the day and, and in the dark. So yes, lighting, lighting matters. The more spectacular, the better. There are some lighting constraints that you'll see in the resources for submitters, but um, none of them in any way uh, uh, cause you not to be able to have a fabulous lighting scheme. Can you remind us of the best website that provides summary as a summary of the goals of the project? Uh, it's, there's just one website. It's uh, urbanconfluence.org. Uh, it's very easy to find. It's, uh, we have lots and lots of material. If you're going to submit, I can't stress enough that you should go and spend some time with all of our materials. We've, we've been at this for three years. We've really worked hard to have really good FAQs. Uh, we've received literally thousands of questions and I've, I've tried to make them uh, palatable and easy to access. So go to our website, spend some time there. And then if you still have questions, pick up the phone and call me. Is a creation specific to the COVID crisis advised, or is it better to stick to something more general, more timeless? Uh, you know, Amy spoke to this earlier. I, we're looking for timelessness, but being timely is also possible. So I think it's up to you. Uh, the bigger the idea, the better. And we, we clearly do want timelessness. We, we are not looking for some structure or artwork that is only relevant for a day or a week or a month. We want people uh, in many generations into the future to look at what we have and find relevance in it. Is there an example proposal that we can model our submissions after? Uh, no, we don't have an example proposal as such, but I think you'll see when you go to submittable that the pro it's so simple that you don't really need one. But if you struggle after you, after you read about the phase one submittal rules, just Call me, I'll explain it to you. In fact, I'll get online with you if necessary and walk you through. Is there a preference to have a single object or something that has many small parts? Amy, you wanna to speak to that? Sure. Um, well, it's a multifaceted answer. The preference is to have a visionary idea that is manifest through whatever form structure you feel supports it. Um, it's also important to think about the entirety of the site and um, the fact that once you, for the three who are invited to continue, part of what they'll be think, asked to think about is how to manifest an iconic gesture, but also to integrate it within the entirety of the park. So definitely we're encouraging you all to think comprehensively of the site. And um, if your iconic idea has multiple structures and multiple attributes to it, um, do not hesitate to articulate that. Also know if your idea is an object, you know, a very dis discreet um, and um, incredible object that doesn't address the rest of the site, if invited to do so, a comprehensive look at the entire park and all of its components will be part of the second phase. So the more you are able to do that in, the sh in this first phase, as long as it really supports your articulation of your iconic idea, we encourage you to do so. But to add to that, I wanna remind you that you don't have to have a, a significant activation strategy in phase one. If you decide to, it's totally acceptable. And as Amy said, in phase two, when we have chosen the three finalists, or I should say when the jury has chosen the three finalists, we will then, give those three $150,000 stipends, each of the three, and help you form a team that will, that will 
uh, help you refine your activation strategy, your net zero strategy, and any of the other aspects of, of the competition. So Amy made a good point, which is if you have more, more of these details in phase one, it'll save you some work in phase two, but it is not required. Our whole idea from the beginning was uh, somewhat inspired by Maya Lin and the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., in the sense that we wanted students and inexperienced people to be able to, to submit in addition to uh, some of the biggest names in the art and architecture world and in the placemaking world. So that was a, kind of a long-winded way of saying you can have lots of detail in phase one if you want, but you don't have to. It's the grand idea that matters most. And while I, since I did mention net zero, we are asking you to, to have a net zero strategy, but it does not have to be hugely refined in phase one. It can be as simple as just a sentence or two that talks about some net zero ideas. Next one is a question for Amy. When you did your project in London, you say you worked with architects in London. Did you also have an architect in California that was the liaison with the UK architects, Amy? Um, no. We, we, um, so Leo Villarreal Studios is based in New York. I'm based remotely out here in California. And um, our architect of record for this project is the London-based architecture firm LDS. They are also one of the architects who built one of the bridges that um, is within the span of the overall artwork. And it was very important. It's a very the, our, our partnership with them is just is paramount. Their their understanding of London, their understanding of process, their understanding of the Thames is is priceless. Thanks, Amy. When we submit without a name, how do we know what our number is and and that you received it? Uh, what do you anticipate the first 50, excuse me, when do you anticipate to announce the first 50 finalists? Uh, and what date will the three finalists be announced? Um, let's take them in order. You have to submit with a name. The, your name and your email address and your phone number are part of the submission on Submittable, but those will not be shared with the community competition panel or with the members of the jury. So there will be full anonymity throughout the entire competition until the three finalists are announced. So the only people whose names will ever be announced to the public are the three finalists. The 50 finalists that this questioner refers to is actually a misnomer. There are not 50 finalists. We have a community competition panel of 30 to 40 local people, leaders of all kinds, who are going to recommend 50 of their favorite designs to the jury. But the jury will look at all submissions. This is really important, so I'm going to say it again. Jury will look at, look at all submissions. The 50 that are recommended by this community panel will be printed on boards, and we will have a display in San Jose somewhere. Uh, that will happen in the month after the competition uh, submission deadline, which is July 1st. So that'll happen in the month of July. The jury will meet in early August and then everything will, will uh, flow, flow from there. So the three finalists will be announced <clears throat> in early August, shortly after the jury meets, but we will have <clears throat> a short time when we have to negotiate and finalize the stipend agreement with the three, uh, with the three finalists and uh, remember that the stipends will be $150,000 each for those three finals. May I add information and images to a project I've already finished submitting? Important question again. Yes, you can do that as many times as you like, but each time you do it, we will have to open it for editing, which we're happy to do, and then you finish, and then we close it for editing. We do our technical review, we tell you that it's okay and we move forward. But yes, you can write up until July 1st, you can change as many times as you like. Paradoxically, one can't design on the most significant part of the site, which is Confluence Point. Why? Confluence Point is a triangle, sort of like a piece of pie that's created where the river and the creek meet. This is a, a reminder, the entire site is a public park. 
Confluence Point has a huge number of artworks from the past and the city of San Jose made the decision that our project will not be on Confluence Point, rather it'll be around Confluence Point. So it has to do completely with the decision by the city of San, San Jose Parks Department and ultimately by the city council. We see there are a lot of fauna on the site. There's really flora and fauna. Is there any documented data available so we can use them to amalgamate with the design proposal? That's an excellent question about detail. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, other than the biology report that is on our site that we commissioned, and you can see that on our resources for submitters, I don't know of any other comprehensive flora and fauna information. But suffice it to say that we care about nature and we will not do anything that damages the, the natural world. I'll also mention that there are, there are fish in the river. Uh, even though the river has been radically changed over the years, the Army Corps of Engineers did a huge channelization project that cost a couple of hundred million dollars about 25 years ago at, after we had a flood on the site. Uh, so the, the river is not a perfect habitat for fish, but uh, fish are resilient and we still have fish in the river. There are many beautiful birds. There are beavers at times and I'm sure uh, other, other fauna that I'm not mentioning like frogs and other things. Can you speak to the mechanics and intention of the anonymous submission? It's interesting and not unwelcome, but frankly, at least at this preliminary stage, it kind of acts as a constraint against engaging the entire team of collaborators simply beyond the vision. One of our strengths is the power of the team. Amy, would you speak to that? Well, um, I can certainly appreciate where that's coming from, um, having participated on multifaceted and, um, you know, uh, multidisciplinary teams. Uh, there's a lot that goes into making these uh, projects happen. Um, I think this is an unconventional approach to being invited to really delve in and create a proposal. So what I can say is for those who have done these sorts of things before, consider this your expression of interest. And um, the jury is selecting the three by merit of idea versus uh, the sort of veracity and legacy of the team. That's really, um, really an important point Amy's making that the, the whole idea of our anonymity was to give everyone an, a, 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 a similar chance to succeed. Uh, many competitions are based on people's large names and their past body of work. We chose to go the opposite way, which is only to care about the merit of the submission. But we also believe very much in the power of the teams and that's why in phase two, uh, we will help supplement your team with whatever whatever type of people are necessary, whether they be structural engineers, uh, net zero experts, uh, or or artists or architects that fill in the gaps that you don't have uh, either as an individual or on your existing team. Amy, you want to supplement that? Sure. I I'd, I'd say again, it sounds like the person who posed that question may come to this with a very comprehensive complement of 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 a team so if the way that the the phase two process is being organized is that it will embrace a comprehensive team that comes to the table with all the attributes and all the consultants and the subcontractors already in line and at the ready to take the the, the phase two go through the phase two process um, but it's also the organization is making sure that um, because the invitation is one that's inviting emerging talent and um, and hoping to find some 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 delightful ideas and really incredible thinking by those who have not had the 
experience themselves, that there will be support for those teams to make it a, an apples to apples submission process to get through phase two. So if your team is set and you've got all the right components, then the organization will um, embrace that. If your team is not completely realized and you need to find and fill some of these important roles to think through all of the detail that will be required, then the organization will support you through that process. And just another way to say that is if you are an individual with a vision without any technical knowledge whatsoever, that's acceptable. You still could be one of the finalists. So please submit regardless of what your experience level is. Are dimensions available for the west and east sides? I see sizes given in acres and square footage, for instant, instance, measured distance on all four sides. There is a, uh, those are scale maps, so you should be able to uh, derive dimensions from those maps. If you still struggle after this webinar, please let me know and I'll, I'll help you how, however is necessary. What's the advantage of the technical evaluation? Will we be able to make changes before the deadline based on the evaluation? That's the whole, the whole point of the technical evaluation is that if you made some technical errors, we have no interest in disqualifying anyone. So there are a bunch of, of rules, including uh, uh, anonymity. Let's take anonymity as a perfect example. If you inadvertently put your name on the design presentation board, Technically, that would be grounds for disqualification, but we have no interest in disqualifying anyone. So by doing the technical evaluation, we, we will get back to you and say, in these three areas, you made mistakes that, that inadvertently violated the rules, please fix them. So it's a very friendly approach to take to making sure that your submissions all qualify and will be moved on to, to the com community competition panel and the jury. And again, if that's confusing, just pick up the phone, give me a call. <clears throat> Are international submissions still allowed given COVID? Absolutely, yes. This is a worldwide competition. A very significant percentage of the submissions are coming in uh, from areas other than the United States, and it's what we always had in mind. Uh, maybe what the questioner is referring to is that in phase two, there will be a time when meetings will happen where, <clears throat> where the uh, three teams will come to San Jose uh, if COVID makes that impossible, we will continue to work and we will use Zoom meetings or some other way to do it. But our intention is for those three teams to come here, meet with the city council, meet with us, and uh, refine the submissions. Can landscape changes, including paths, paving, et cetera, beyond the structure's site boundaries? This is really a good question, and I, I wish I had a more uh, detailed answer for you, but what I can say is inside the riparian corridor, the city will probably embrace minor changes, things like paths and paving and even landscaping, uh, as long as it's native. There's a frequently asked question that addresses this, so uh, whoever asked this, if you go to read the FAQs after this, uh, it, you'll see that in there, but you cannot put structural foundation elements, et cetera, inside of the riparian corridor. And we can't do anything inside the banks of the river. So that, that's off limits. Even though we're hoping after our competition that we could support our Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services group and also the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy, they are the stewards of the park. We'd love to do more fundraising, work with them, make the river, the, the, the creek and everything uh, far more sparkly than it currently is. I don't have technology to create an architectonic visual to share my view, but I have a vision and sharing a visual is so important to share my view. I know that it is not required to submit it, but I want to know if there is any way to create it for an artist, not an architect. Uh, that's full of a bunch of questions. The first one I'll approach is, the technology. You don't have to use any kind of digital tools at all. You could you can hand sketch your vision if that's what you choose to do, or you can use any and all uh, digital tools that are available for design. So I know that's a, a really wide answer and that's very intentional. So your, your design can look any way you choose. And I can't tell you as an artist or architect what to use <clears throat> and what not to use. I'll, I'll simply say that 
you want to be able to express your vision. Amy, can you speak to that a little as someone who's got a lot of experience with the technology and in, in uh, competitions? Um, yes, I completely empathize with the desire to have the most fully realized and uh, you know uh, simulations and examples, uh, but if you don't have access to those resources or those skills, I really encourage you to dig into your conceptual artist place and articulate your vision in any way you can. A line drawing, a simple line drawing could be, uh, you know, think about, think about the images that we just saw of, of the running fence. You know, that, you know, be inspired by beautiful, large scale expressions of public art. They're generally simple, quote unquote, but it's the scale that is um, manifests the, 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 the so, much, so much of its power. So I guess I'm just encouraging you to use what you have and, um, and, and don't hesitate to express yourself the best you possibly can. And I, to say that a different way, if somebody submits a line drawing, that will be looked at with as much seriousness as <clears throat> something that comes from the most powerful uh, uh, Adobe software or, or any other design tools. A question, who are the panelists on this call? Uh, Amy Critchett, uh, who has been speaking much of the time. My name is Steve Borkenhagen. I'm the executive director of Urban Confluence Silicon Valley. Uh, Amy is an expert in the area of, of public art and uh, has been a consultant to us and has been hugely helpful to us in doing a better job. Can part of the future monument overhang from the plot on-site, yes, off-site, no. That is, if somebody had a large cantilevered aspect, uh, it could go over the river and the creek. You can have bridges that go all the way across from east, east to west, but uh, nothing can extend over the sidewalks that surround the site. And that should be very clear on the site map. That is, the limits of the site are very clear on the site map. How are the jurors going to review the submissions <clears throat> Excuse me, is every juror going to review every submission? Yes, they are going to review all of them and they are going to be doing that on the submittable platform, which is set up such that we can give any access we want to whomever we, we please. So for example, I can see your name, your phone number, your email address, etc. So only my assistant Denise and I see those things. No one else will see them. So when when the community competition panel and jury view them on submittable, they will only be able to see your design presentation board, your project statement, your project summary, and your video. So the point is that anonymity will be respected there. Steve, someone asked a good question about the budget. Go ahead, Amy. Uh, do you expect a preliminary budget with a submission? Should we be working with a prescribed budget range? Thank you. The answer is that we have been very intentional about not asking you to do any kind of budget. We want you to be a visionary and not be thinking about the financial constraints. Now that's not to say that financial constraints will never exist. Of course they do. We all live in the world of, of money. But our position is that a far more expensive world-class object will be easier to fund than something that's pedestrian that costs a small amount of money. So don't constrain yourself based on budget at this point. If we did end up with something that had some kind of an impossible budget, we would work through that in phase two and phase three with, with you, the submitters. Amy, you want to add to that? Um, just that I can understand the challenge of, of going through a design process without the constraint of a budget. Um, and Again, I really encourage you all to embrace this in an unconventional way, which is absolutely, when you think comprehensively of the site, when you think comprehensively of the idea, um, there's going to be a very rigorous uh, budgeting process that will 
that will embrace both, you know, all aspects, the iconic idea, the park as, uh, as from a placemaking perspective, um, ongoing operations and maintenance, how the net zero approach will support the entire site, and um, ultimately ongoing, what, will, what sort of programming will continue to activate the site once you know, the unveiling ceremony has happened and um, um, the site is an, a functioning opportunity um, ongoing. So there's all sorts of levels of, of very serious budgeting that are going to take place. Um, I applaud the organization for not constraining your idea creation at this point, but speaking from experience, I also understand how that can be a challenge. Uh, another reminder about activation is you might have an idea for cafes or bars or restaurants or museums or visitor centers or anything, any other creative ideas. You don't have to completely draw those in phase one. So if you wanted to have a place on the site that said cafe or bar, you could do that knowing that in phase two and phase three, the details of that are going to flesh themselves out. So it's just a reminder to be as creative as you can, not just with your either sculptural or, or architectural aspect or landscape uh, architectural aspect that you create, but also with the use of the site. So, you know, whether that might be a, you know, a bar up 200 feet in the air or anything else, the, the, it's all about dramatic, exciting ideas in phase one. Should, for people who submit hand drawings, is it necessary to put a specific scale? Uh, yes, you should, you should give scale uh, with, with the, the drawings that you give. But if that's a problem for you, uh, ask, ask me and I'll, I'll to slightly contradict that. The most important part is that when, when we look at your design presentation board, that your grand vision is spectacular. That's more, more important than um, micro scale issues. In difficult times like this, when many people are laid off work in the United States, how likely is it that our design proposal will be built? Well, first off, we don't expect the current situation to last forever. Secondly, I'll say that one of the main strengths that we have is that we happen to exist in possibly the wealthiest place, if not now, maybe in the history of the world. There are a huge number of philanthropists, whether they're foundations or individuals, that love art and support art. So we fully intend to get this built. That would be my answer, regardless of, of COVID or anything else. And we've been networking for the past three years and we'll continue to do so, so <clears throat> until we are done. Will you and the jury take into consideration the public comments displayed on the submissions? If yes, would you prevent submitters and engaging friends into co commenting publicly? Uh, there's no way that we can cause anyone not to comment. And if you as a submitter wanted to get your friends to comment, you, you, you would do that whether we uh, asked you not to problem or, or not. But uh, part of our process is definitely going to have all of the submissions available for public comment. That's part of our agreement with the city. We look forward to that. Those comments will be shared with the community competition and with the jury. And uh, I don't see any issues with that whatsoever. As you all know, uh, beautiful or spectacular art and architecture are always controversial. Almost all designs have, have detractors and they also have supporters. We don't expect our project to be any different in that sense. Is contemporary and future building in the area constrained by height restrictions? Absolutely, yes. We are in the flight path of San Jose Mineta Airport. There's very clear height limits. Uh, the lowest buildings would be directly in the runway like we are, where they're in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 feet. And then as you head either to the west or to the east, they get higher. So every, every building in, in and around downtown San Jose is constrained as far as its height. Many of the buildings from the last 20 years or so, to give you a sense of scale, are in the approximately 300 foot range within about half a mile of, the, of our site. Can we mention the skills of the team leaving names off? Certainly, yes. Uh, just make sure the anonymity is there. For, but for example, 
uh, if Leo Villarreal was on your team and he is not going to be on the team because he's not going to participate, thus, thus Amy has no conflict in working with us. If you said, I have the lighting artist from Bay Lights on my team, that would violate anonymity. But if you said, I have a world-class lighting artist, that would be acceptable. So just be, be mindful of the position that we are in uh, as it relates to the jury. Will seismic influences need to be considered even in phase two? Certainly not in phase one. Yes, in phase two and or phase three. Phase three would be the pre-construction phase after we've selected a winner. You do not need to worry about seismic right now. Uh, every project built in California has seismic considerations. We will, we will be no exception. Also, as far as CEQA, the Environmental Quality Act, that will happen later on, but you, you don't need to uh, concern yourself with that in phase one, we will, we will do that in phase two. Can you please provide exact location of tree species now in phase one? The answer is no, uh, no such map exists, at least that we've been able to find. So uh, what I'll tell you though, is there are lots of trees both in the riparian corridor and uh, on the sites uh, outside of the riparian corridor and most of the trees on the east and west in the buildable area were all planted at approximately the same time when the park was built, approximately 25 or 30 years ago. They all are approximately the same size and they are not heritage trees. And what that means is that they can be eliminated. Now we will, we with in agreement with the city, will end up replanting trees somewhere for any tree that's removed. But in theory, that all of the trees on the site could be either removed or replaced. Again, we would not tell you to willy-nilly just eliminate all the trees. We love trees. Parks need trees. But uh, if your design involved elimination of the existing trees and changing them, uh, that is acceptable. Well, it's 9.58. We're going to sign off in a moment. Amy, would you like to close? And then I'll come in behind you. Sure. Um I want to acknowledge the last question, which is around uh, maintenance of the landmark in the future. Um, and reiterate that certainly operations and maintenance of the landmark and the entire site um, are going to be part of the consideration and the strategy and the funding of whatever the final um, design is. And you and your team working with the or Steve and his team will go through a very serious uh, uh, and rigorous process to make sure that in phase two, the beginning of those strategies are, are articulated. Um, that said, I really encourage you guys to go for it. Really think about the, you know, it's, you know, peel back the layers of the onion on this one. You know, you've got this, you know, incredible, and terrifying time that we live in. You've got this incredible site in the heart of one of the most vibrant um, communities, not only in California and the United States, but in the world. You've got a team, an organization that is putting everything they have into making this opportunity happen for you. And, um, use this time, you know, use this time to, to do, you know, imagine what Christo and Jean-Claude did when they were thinking about the running fence. They were thinking about creating something magnificent and timeless and hard, but it takes a lot of effort to look effortless. And if you and your design is chosen to and invited to continue through the process, and then ultimately you become partnered with this organization, this will be many years in the making. So really think about that now and think about what you'll be, what you're passionate about and what you're passionate about seeing through to the very end. Thank you, Amy, for all the inspirational comments today. Uh, you've certainly re-inspired me. I wanna to say to everyone online, we appreciate your interest, please submit. If I did not, or and Amy did not answer your question that you typed, uh, please just send it via email to me and I promise you an answer. Or if you'd prefer, you can always give us a call. 
So with that, I'll say thank you. We will be having other webinars. We, we will be having uh, at least one more site tour. We are here to support you in all ways possible. And thank you again. Have a good day.